Please welcome to the stage, Brian Schliefer, Senior System Security Cybersecurity Engineer and Analyst at Modern Technology Solutions, Inc. Brian will help kick off day two with his presentation, How Cybersecurity Techniques from Weapon Systems and Other Industries Can Help Protect ICS. Let's get fired up. Let's get fired up. Yep, can't do it. All right, so there we go. All right, so I had some, I had PRK surgery, so bright lights, I don't know. Does it look bad? Does it look bad? Can I pull it off? It's good? Yeah, it's a facade. I'm not as cool as the glasses make me look, but that's okay. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when people are seeing this and watching it. Uh, my name is Brian Schleifer, uh, not Schleifer, but you know, when you rely on AI to, to read things, that's how it comes off. Um, <laughs> I go by Schleife. It's a lot easier. Some of you I've met already. Um, it's, you know, life or knife, Schleife, pretty, pretty easy. There's about 50 Brian's. Any Brian's in the room right now? Not that I knew. Hey, there you go. How many Schleifes? Okay, good. Now we've determined that. So I'm going to do a little background. I, I talked to McFly, my, my counterpart in crime here. He had some really cool like slides with pictures, and I thought about doing that. And then I thought, man, I've gained like 30 pounds since then, so maybe I'll just not do the actual pictures. Oh, sorry, I'm no, I know I'm a walker, I told him. I'm a walker, I'm dynamic. So I did 20 years in the military, uh, the Air Force specifically, but it was a little different for me. I wasn't stuck in like one place doing one thing. So I had the opportunity to work things like desktops, servers, infrastructure, designing infrastructure, installing infrastructure, and not only that, but it was actually in different locations. So some of them CONUS, which means here in our home states, and some of it being overseas. Some of the other things that were pretty cool, um, mobile communications. So I was very fortunate, I had the opportunity to be part of a squadron that went overseas, and it was a self-sustained unit. What I mean by that is we had our own medical professionals, our own folks that took care of logistics, SATCOM, computer systems, and so on, while being able to maintain our mission. So what does this mean? I had the opportunity to live in Germany or Deutschland, as some of my folks here call it, uh, living in England, and there's a lot of that different culture that brings aspects to a lot of your communities. Having folks overseas and the implementation and the culture and how you actually have to speak with them and changes in body languages and approaches in conference rooms, all these small things come together. So I got to do all of that stuff and then I got to support some other programs with some uh, remotely piloted aircraft, also called UAVs, uh, which was a, also a very good time. And uh, my career culminated in me retiring in Florida, uh, supporting AFSOC, which is the Air, Air Force Special Operations Command. Um, and then after that, I got to join, in my opinion, one of the best companies out there, Modern Technology Solutions Incorporated. Uh, it's not Mitzi. It's MTSI. Last year I came and I was like, nope, it's, I've never heard anyone call it Mitzi. So that was the first time, so thank you all for bringing that to our attention. Um, so it is MTSI. A large part of our customer base is the defense industry. However, we are also, uh, we do support some other commercial companies uh, doing different things in cyber and engineering. So MTSI, Transparency, was created in 1993 as an engineering firm. So why am I here? Why am I going to speak with you when you say, hey, have you ever been inside of a plant? Sure, I was in Hershey, Pennsylvania. I saw how they make chocolate. <laughs> have I ever been to a water treatment plant? No, but I've driven by and I'm like, how do people work inside there? Because I catch it in the highway and I'm like, holy, holy cow. And I've, I've worn gas masks, I know how it feels. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about some of the things I've experienced as my current uh, customers I support in the system program office through acquisitions from a defense industry perspective. Along with that, some additional studying and research on other industries, such as medical and so on, which I was happy to hear. I think Paulo Alto and some other folks were also bridging the gap there in that industry. Green button. Green button. 
Green button. Not green button? Oh, that's the laser. Big green button. Big, big dumb animal, animal right there, right there. <laughs> Big green button, okay, cool. So this is sort of what I talked about, right? I, I, again, you go in and, you know, while the defense industry has been looking at doing cybersecurity on munitions and aircraft platforms and so on, it hasn't been that long. So you start to branch out and you research and you look at all these things and you go, okay, what can we do and how can we do it better? Because you don't ever want to work in a siloed approach from a research perspective. I hope that most of you agree. So you go, okay, what if medical is actually protecting this a certain way? Can we leverage that in the defense industry? How about other ICS OT? How are they doing certain things for cyber physical systems? Can we leverage that? So I have a very, very strong belief that there's some cross-pollination collaboration that can occur. I think Chris talked about it, right? Some collaboration. All right, I saw my safety buddy here, representing here. So there's, there's a couple of, uh, I don't know, I don't like the word problems, I like to call them challenges, because I believe these things can become, or be overcome for sure. So reason one, security versus safety. As McFly uh, spoke a lot about, when you're in an aircraft, safety is a pretty big deal. When you're in a ship or a boat, safety is a pretty big deal. When you're in a car, Humvee, attack vehicle, safety is a pretty big deal. So what do they do? They build in a lot of hardware fault trees and sometimes logic fault trees. What does this mean? If this happens, this happens, this happens, but we'll stop it here. So in other words, anybody ever heard of weight on wheels? Weight on wheels, anybody know what that means? Oh, okay. Thanks, McFly. Yeah, I got some support. So weight on wheels is you cannot do certain actions because there's a sensor in the aircraft, so it's on the ground, so you can't do that. So you know there's a little bit of like, uh, I'm watching a war movie, they're on you know, the tarmac, a runway, taxiway, and they start shooting off munitions. There's some things you have to override to make that happen. Or let's say you're uh, in a commercial aircraft, you don't want certain actions to happen on the, on the wings or the jet engine particularly uh, because it can snap and break structures. So there's certain things and devices in place. So another thing would be in a munition. Uh, you wouldn't really want to um, necessarily, I don't know, accidentally ignite a fuse of a munition while you're on the ground in an aircraft, that would be a bad day for a lot of people. So there's safety things that are put in place. Well, what do we do? We're cybersecurity. I wanna make sure it's secure. I wanna make sure that logic bearing device is so secure, maybe it may or may not trigger a safety situation, um, or maybe it doesn't allow that fault tree analysis to take place. And what I mean by that is, there is that balance. There's that balance of saying, okay, we're looking, we have safety folks sitting in the room. Some of the other, oh, I know that um, John talked about that earlier. I'm a heavy believer of having engineers in the room when we have these conversations, especially during design. I want that safety representative there. Hey, we're really thinking about uh, doing this to assist and to protect this, and yeah, man, don't touch that. Why not? Well, because then you're gonna allow for this happen and the wing will fall off the aircraft. Well, that's probably not a good situation to be in. I don't want to have that happen, not with my name on it at least. Um, the other thing here, man, and my eyes are not very good at reading these little letters, security versus performance. Self-explanatory to a sense, but again, you have the folks in there from a requirement standpoint that are saying, not only do I need it to function, but I need to function at this level. But guess what, you're gonna lose your security if you do that. Well, hey, listen, it has to function at this level. It has to. And you have to be able to sit down and have a critical analysis and thinking and discussion and collaboration and say, okay, I got it. And there's trade-offs. Trade-offs are huge. Everybody should know trade-offs. Not like stock market trades, but trade-offs in the boardroom. You guys understand what that is? Whoops. Man, big red button. So tempting all the time. Reason three, security versus resource allocation. I heard that last year. I've heard that this year. Over and over and over again. We don't have the people, we don't have the budget. A lot of people mention budget, DOD's no exception to that. 
We just don't have the budget to this. So what do you do? What's that? Do it anyway. The cheapest webcam out there, right, McFly? The cheapest one you can get out there. So you, you just have to keep going forward. And again, it's all about balance and trade-off. But what is our job? Our job is sometimes we can't fix it. Sometimes we don't have the choices, the resource allocation, but we need to bring that information forward. We have to inform the right people. We have to use the right words. We have to have the right people in the room. That is the most important thing to do because then they can make an informed decision on their risk. That is one of the most important things to do. If they're not aware, then how do they know that they need a, I say palm, that's a DOD term. How do they, need, <laughs> how do they know they need to actually allocate funds next year or the next year and build it into place? And document, Where, is Maurice in here? I don't think Maurice is in here, I can't see anyways. Documentation is huge, policy is huge. You have to do those kind of things. Big green button. What's a weapon system? I'll do a little bit of slide reading here. So a weapon system is a combination of one or more weapons with all related equipment, material service, personnel, and means of delivery and deployment if applicable required for self-sufficiency. How many people think a network system can be a weapon system? Yep, I see one hand, a couple, well, you guys nah, y are cheating, you know the answer. That's like, <laughs> cool, a couple of people. So if I have a network system and it's weaponizing some things that are gonna do bad things to bad people, uh, it definitely falls into that. A lot of people always say munitions, vehicles, you know, that kind of stuff, but there are some actual networks. So weapon systems and ICS, the similarities and differences. Oh, the pictures, how they turn out. Can you guys see that? It's pretty cool. And by the way, I, I reread this, right, for familiarity's sake, and I saw a stereo location, and I was like, oh, you could probably do a little arm wrestling on a stereo location, because there are quite a few plants, critical infrastructure, and some pretty rough parts of the world. And they are, you know, potentially getting attacked and so on, so we could always arm wrestle on a stereo. But some of the differences produce different products. I hope that if you're not in the defense industry, you're not producing things that are doing bad things to bad people. I can't guarantee that. I don't know y'all too well, but if you are, I mean, okay, don't tell me. Um, <laughs> the other thing is the acquisition process. Government, you guys heard it, right? We have a lot of documentation out there, a lot that tells us how we do things. Y'all have some other regulations. The defense industry is a little bit different, again, because of the product it produces. But fear not, everyone in the room, there's some similarities. That's right. That's why we're here having this conversation, or at least right now. I'll ask questions, and then we'll go back and forth later, Jack. Embedded system security. We deal with it every day. It might not be a PLC, but there could be an FPGA in a munition or in an LRU in an aircraft. Line replaceable unit, sorry, yep, I'll work on the acronyms here. I'll work on the acronyms. Uh, what about RTOS, real-time operating system? Yep, yep, we, we deal with those, yep, some VX works and so on. Just like a lot of other folks that deal with embedded systems, we sure do, yep, yep, yep. Um, I don't know, what about protocol variances? Think we have those? 1553, 1760. Maybe a little dabble in the commercial. I always say Arc Inc. 429, but I can't, I don't know. I always pronounce it incorrectly. CAN bus, mod bus, do you think we have? Absolutely. Absolutely, sure do. Absolutely. Proprietary protocol. Oh, yeah, we have some proprietary protocols. I mean, we are basically becoming best friends right now. I don't know if you guys are aware of that or not. Oh, not directly connected to traditional networks. I think John hit on that, right? There's some mesh networks, crazy networks going on. I mean, again, the gentleman said at the robots, dogs, munitions, I mean, talking to cats and dogs and tanks, they're all living together these days, you know? It's a good time. Um, and then on the bottom there, data timing. Okay, one of my things, so as I'm sitting through the design process, one of the things I ask all the time is, if we're gonna put security on this, is it gonna affect the data timing? Is it gonna affect performance? Are we gonna have latency? 
Is it gonna make more collisions, less collisions? What are we doing? I saw there was a booth out there about packet filtering. There's mirror porting, there's firewalls. When you get to some of these real-time operating systems and cyber physical systems, that is so pivotal and important. And I, I wanna hit something because I get very passionate about it. A lot of folks in here, we're having conversations and they're like, well, you know, the OEM and the vendor and they're providing this and you're the consumer supply and demand. You, I mean, listen, if you wanna hire somebody, maybe you say, you know, we don't need five cyber people. Maybe we're gonna hire one really good contracting person. And they're gonna write such language in there that we're gonna have the capabilities built into these devices and systems. And then next year, then you get another cyber person on your team, right? But that is so pivotal to ensure that that language is in there. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. Seat at the table with the people designing systems. Has anybody ever seen this model before? Good, because I made it, so hopefully no one else has seen it. <laughs> if you did, I'm like, darn it. I tried Googling and finding it, but then Google data caches it, and I'm like, oh, now everyone's gonna have it when they look at it next time. Functionality, well, we need this thing to function. It does no good if it just sits there. Hey, let's buy it, and it falls apart. That's great. That's never good. All right, let's buy it, and then you just turn it on, and all the circuitry just, boop, puff. Interoperability. So this is great. How many people know the difference between interoperability and compatibility? No one? Are you all shy? I was, wait, I was excited because it's 1025, thanks Chris. I was excited because 1025, some folks have had some coffee, you know, maybe a couple Red Bulls, some Monsters, five hour energy, three cups of tea. Thank you, yeah, get fired up, y'all, get fired up. So interoperability, internal, right? So I'm making sure that if it's a chip or a processor on a board that it's actually communicating, processing, storing as needed. Compatibility, now I'm actually gonna have an interface connected to something else. What happens when they're designing that? Do you see those big bars on the side? Do they call me in or my buddy from safety? and say, hey, let's consider that as we're doing each of these from a design process? No. Nobody wants the sand and the gears that slow down the machine, as one of my coworkers always said. Safety and security. <laughs> the sand and the gears of the machine. Never loved it, never loved it. Did some cool things though, did some cool things. So always taking into consideration, again, forcing it into contract language, make sure that this stuff is happening. It's pivotal, it makes your job a lot easier. Even somebody, what was it, two days ago, all my days are blending together, said it's four times the amount, the cost, to put security in after the fact. And they didn't, he didn't break it down and talk about these levels, but it could potentially go up or down at any of these levels. Again, you could have something super secure and functional and it's just not compatible, or it won't talk to anything else. That's never a good day. Okay, here's the things, now we're getting into the meat and potatoes. And if you're not into meat, potatoes, and you're vegan, squash and lettuce, whatever, whatever is good for y'all. Really good food here this year, by the way, Mike, really good food. Yeah. All right, supply chain risk management, digital engineering, system configuration, modular systems, and one of my favorite, I, you can call it buzzword all you want, but it really reigns true cyber hygiene, right? Hygiene, love it brushing the teeth, all kind of fun things. Okay, how many people have heard of cyber supply chain risk management? Okay, all right. Have you seen it in documentation outside of a publication? Yes, thanks Maurice. You are here, hey, glad you made it Maurice. Veteran, future, yeah. So, Really important, I, I will tell you, um, I know there's a lot of bullets on this slide, but one of the important things is training because you have some folks that have the traditional supply chain background. 
And then maybe you add some verbiage and they're like, cyber, what is, what is cyber supply chain risk? I don't understand what that is. And then you pull up that NIST. I think I have it on the, the bottom there referenced. Um, the NIST is phenomenal, by the way. For cyber folks that read it, it makes a lot of sense. They did a great job doing it. I would shake those people's hands that actually wrote that. But it's hard for them to grasp and wrap their head. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Am I looking at this nail and going, okay, what am I doing with this nail? Is the thread count good? Like, and then it goes back a couple? Or this battery and I go back, is this battery going to be degraded? Is that cyber supply chain? What about logic bearing devices? Ah, logic bearing devices. That, those, I don't know, there's some ones and zeros added on that. Maybe that's where we need to focus. So you train them, logic bearing device, give them some analogies. And then you say, listen, you know how you track things down the road, right? And you're like, okay, this supplier we heard, or trend analysis amongst parts and friends of the ICS community. These batteries are starting to go bad. You guys see the report on that? I don't understand what's going on here. Why? And then boom, track it, boom, track it, boom, down to this lot. Hey, everybody, if you have this lot, uh, you might want to look into it. Those batteries are degrading at about a five and a half year period of time. So if you have it, you want to find some downtime and yank it. How does that relate to cyber? Uh, John talked about it. I have a disagreement with John, my buddy John, also Air Force Marine, so there's probably more disagreements there. He said, hey, we want to look at supply chain and look at three tiers down. So in today's, today's world, if, you, if you've spoken with any of your supply chain folks, it's not three tiers, seven, eight tiers down. I have a big company, they have a smaller company, who has a smaller company, who goes down, down. Then you have the mom and pop. Mom and pop, talk to the aunt and uncle. Aunt and uncle have some older nieces and nephews that are outside the child labor law, and that's who actually builds it. So why is that important? Who cares? I don't care. They're meeting all the laws and requirements. Well, then somebody that you may not like starts to buy up these companies. They may or may not keep the same name. They may or may not start ingesting certain code in these things. And you're like, yeah, we bought, they're trusted vendors. Quotes, quotes, quotes. Is that universal? I think that's pretty internationally universal. Quote, quote, quote. They're trusted vendors, trusted, trusted, trusted. Listen, you can trust them all day long, but I'm gonna call John and McFly to come do some vetting for me. I'm gonna trust it, but I bet you there, there might be some line of code in there that past functionality, compatibility, uh, interoperability, but guess what? Um, it's gonna start sending some signals out that I don't want. Or after a certain amount of use, just pfft. You have to track this, add it. It's not something outside of what they're already tracking. But again, it's an awareness and education. You have to make it fun. I don't see Haley and George in here, but we were talking about training in general in cyber, and you gotta make it fun. Those, everyone's talking about those boring year-long videos. Dress somebody up like your CEO and make a video and like add it and do like 30 minutes and have a little bit of fun and briefing in it. Because again, someone's like, oh, cyber, oh, the, the gentleman in the panel, like telling about interviews, like, hey, you know, no one's gonna wanna hire you. Not if you make it fun, you gotta have fun, do it, be aware. Write a guide about it. I, listen, how many people talked about asset inventory? It should be, I think someone said that should be a drinking game for everyone over 21 that should be in here. Poor, poor Mike had just a bunch of, um, people walking around in circles if we had a drinking game with asset inventory in every briefing when you might <laughs> be a bad day for everybody. All right, uh, that, that's the biggest thing. So again, why and how do you do this? Write it into your documentation. Have somebody review it. It's, it's a pivotal, pivotal part. Chain of custody, do you got, are you all familiar with chain of custody? Everyone watches TV shows. You had the, I don't know, bloody cloth, but someone didn't put it in a bag and seal it, and so then the bad person gets off. That's what happens with FPGAs, just to let y'all know. Ooh, transition. Digital engineering, okay. I heard a couple of people talk about digital twins in here. A couple of times here and some other, some other rooms. There's a lot out there, but one of the things I didn't really hear, and it's because in our world it's a little different, is model-based system engineering. Model-based system engineering is a really good complement to digital twinning. What do I mean by that? First and foremost, find the right tool for the job. It could be an UML, uh, SysML, some kind of language, right? Whatever model you want to find. 
There's a lot of tools out there and vendors that are like, hey, if I put this device on, it's gonna replicate and then you'll know it's there. I, I mean, I believe a little bit of that, but I've seen enough networks and been around the block to know that doesn't always work. I won't give you a percentage because then I'd be making it up, but let's say it goes 75%. I did give you a percentage. I made it up, it's okay. You wanna find that because guess what happens? If you have somebody, uh, the, the, is Brad here? Brad was talking about how the external and they do the mapping. It's cool, but there's a lot of dependencies, right? So while you can have something static, if you want something dynamic, they have the things like in Cameo, if anybody's ever heard of Cameo, Cameo? No, nobody? Oh, thanks, Mike. Okay, thank you, sir. Yep, so there's called stereotypes. So it's like dependencies. So if I remove this or change this, it'll highlight all of those things that are interacted. So it can become, as I change, an authoritative source of truth. And that's great, it's digital, it's dynamic, and do those things, sometimes schematics and other paperwork, uh, not so great. It is good to print it out after a while though. Anybody familiar with the system engineering V? Are most people mechanical engineers? Wow, really? Not even one hand, holy cow. Oh, one hand, thank you, safety brother. And that's why I invited him over here. I just like raise your hand when no one else does. I appreciate that, thanks. So it starts off with the requirements, goes down to design, goes back down to the bottom, then there's some prototyping, testing, and then validation and verification. And by the way, I may be getting those mixed up, validation, verification. And then everyone's favorite buzzword, agile. You have to be agile, agile. I know it hurts people's brains now. What does that mean, agile? Are we using the scrub method or spiral? Are we using JIRA or Confluence? What are we doing that's agile? Synergy, agile, it's good times. Those are competing, <laughs> they're very competing. So hey, let's do this, we're gonna do two week sprints, we're gonna come up, we'll have a milestone, blah. and then you get into a meeting and they're like, all right, so we're gonna do a waterfall schedule, and then you're gonna go back and put it into your JIRA, and then do two weeks, and it, oh, <laughs> what's happening here? We are, we are having some competing efforts. Right? You have to talk to those people and tell them, those are literally competing methodologies that you're talking to me about right now. Whoops. Oh yes, this is a great, great slide. Configuration of systems. Okay, so we were talking earlier. I, I looked up, um, you know, agnostic if you will, but like there's some, <laughs> vulnerabilities that were coming up with certain PLCs and devices of companies. I was like, ooh, interesting. I wonder if I could find some documentation to see where I could change the configuration to help that out, right? From a, from a consumer standpoint, is it readily available? Something I can just Google or I can talk to McFly and he can go behind the curtain and find some of that documentation on other webs, if you will. Just kidding, he doesn't do that. It was hard. It was really hard to find it. Not only was it hard to find it, then I was like, it didn't have the right drop down arrows and things to actually change the configuration necessary to help combat some of those vulnerabilities. So I'm like, what do you do? If you're, not, if you're not able to change it at that level, that's not good. How many people actually buy, now I saw there was a gentleman the first day sitting in one of the briefings and there was a joke and he's like, yeah, some of these old PLCs, not a lot of people know how to code it. And he's like, <clears throat> I do. Um, it's true, they're out there, but it's, it's one of those things is when you buy something, do you actually vet it? Do you change the configuration from a functionality standpoint? Do you hire someone in to check a couple of those numbers of the lots, like a McFly or John, in an instance, to come actually do some testing to see if those security configurations that you were promised in documentation or verbally at a boardroom are actually part of that device? Rhetorical question, okay. Thank you for answering. Um, I did read a couple of uh, things recently about some vendors that said, hey, we're starting to do encryption here and we're doing this and I think it's TLS 2.0 or I can't remember what's on there. And I was like, oh, that's fantastic. Is that uh, interoperable with other things? Is that gonna work? How far does that go? Am I gonna start experiencing latency issues? Is that data gonna be good at the end of the day? Where am I encrypting and decrypting at, that at? Is it just internal? Is it proprietary? So I, I heard a lot about this. There's a lot of pros and con cons to this. And so the heterogeneous versus homogeneous. How many people understand those words? A couple of people. So 
one versus many. So I have all of one brand or I have a multitude of many brands. Why is that important? People are like, ah, from a security aspect, but what about training? Training's a big deal too. Did you know in the medical field not too long ago, the healthcare industry, that there were certain pumps and devices that were all different and they actually had two buttons really close to each other and they were killing people? So they came out with something not too long ago with some regulations that were like, please stop doing that. <laughs> please don't do that. Don't push this button here, don't put that there, that's just a bad day. That's my little like don't push the wrong button thing. Are people getting trained on this? Do they look at it, do they look through the configuration? Am I gonna have to train a lot of people? But also, hey, if I have like five of my X vendor go down, do I still have these other vendors up? When I have patches come down, what's the kind of management that I have to deal with or configuration changes or firmware updates? Because everybody knows, right, you're, you're vetting the firmware updates with our cyber supply chain, right? You're looking at the logic coming down, not just the hardware. Everybody, I think, thank you for the head nod too. I'm gonna pay you like five bucks after this. Yep, talked about that, talked about that. Security features, talked about that. And then API, how many people are familiar with APIs? Oh good, more hands than homo and heterogeneous? How crazy is that? All the tech people are in this room. <laughs> so APIs, right, the translator. Can I build security into APIs? Oh, a couple of head nods, now I'm getting, oh, this is great. We're gonna get into a dance party pretty soon. Absolutely, look at it, look at it. Cybersecurity hygiene. Oh, yeah, let's get fired up. Physical access. How important is physical access? V I'm sorry, what was that? Very important. Okay, 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 okay. What about connections? Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. We don't have our Brad, our Exxon guy in here. Do, do we, Brad? Is that Brad back there? What's up, Brad? External connections, big deal, right? RF. Uh, as McFly was talking, there's all kind of fun stuff out there you can go buy. Readily available, readily available. Hey, yeah, we're gonna encrypt this data all day long, and then you have somebody come out, and the next thing you know, they're like, hey, man, I can read all this data, all of it. Oh, not only that, now I can manipulate it, and then I can send it back. Playback attack, anybody? Okay, everyone's good, thank you, again. Love it. Accountability, accountability. Are we checking the logs? Yep, we spent all this money, and they're getting produced. How often do we have somebody sitting and looking at it? Is it getting to a third party? Are they looking at it? Do they know what we're concerned about, or are they just looking at industry and standard practices? So by the way, that's a picture of one of my five children there with the binoculars. She has ADHD. See something, say something. I promise you, if something was out of place, she would tell me and let me know. So part of your cyber training is like, if you see something weird, you've been working on this plant floor for 20 years. Something's going a little, that's really weird. This, this screen glitched or something is just, the data, I, I, we're getting this and it's, there's a delay. Like I used to hit this button and this did this and now there's like, there's this delay that's never occurred. Why is this happening? It's just part of the cyber hygiene. It's part of the cyber hygiene. We actually created a document because during some testing, we had a lot of vendors coming in and bringing their things in and they weren't going through any vetting. So I said, hey, we should probably create something. And they're like, but how do we know? Because sometimes those people that are out on the aircraft or doing other testing are not aware. So we had this, I, I, I went and bought these really unique glitter sparkly poop emoji stickers. And so I put them on the devices that went through the vetting process, you know, turning off Bluetooth speakers, all that at the BIOS level, by the way, and then I would initial it. And so it gives you a little bit of sense like, okay, it went through something. Right, rather than these people walking around. I haven't heard that in a conversation at all. You know, there is the wireless, but sometimes you actually have to have somebody come in with the device. Did that get checked at all? You never know. It could be unintentionally recording and taking all kind of good information out. Modular open systems approach. This is a little bit different in the defense industry. There's some actually directive behind this, is we utilize the APIs, right? Anything behind that needs to be able to plug right in as long as you know the API and be able to function. And that's all the way down to a munition standpoint. So what's the big deal with munitions? I don't know, because they're not really connected to power for very long, they do all these things, there's thermal concerns, a little bit different, right? Internal to a container. So if I need to replace something, you think it's like a big part or a small part? Probably a small part, right answer, thanks for participating. I have a couple of references here. Um, as you can tell, a lot of open source. So McFly, John, and myself, right, supporting defense industry. Um, we can only go so far and so deep uh, into some of our conversations and information that we, that we like to provide out there. However, I am here 
with a couple minutes left to answer any questions to the best of my ability and what I'm allowed to say. And questions. No questions. Oh, McFly. What cyber? So it's funny, cyber came in like, I think it was two, was it 2010 or 2012 from the word cybernetics, which had to do with information technology and computer systems, I think was the actual definition of it. I looked it up because a lot of people did have a, somebody's like, I worked, oh, it was our Retina, if she's in here. Retina was like, yep, I did this, and then I did IA, and IA flipped to, to cyber. So that, that word just transitioned over. We never built that in, right? So trying to retroactively put that in has been so expensive that my business has been like, eh, you know. So do you have any recommendations on how we could do that effectively? Yeah, so money means things. So he asked, hey, you know, retroactively speaking, how can we go back and add some supply chain risk management and tracking because we haven't done that before. So, you know, one of the first steps is like look at, because you should have some kind of supply chain risk management place, like our program in place first and foremost. So you talk to those people and say, hey, listen, here's something that we need to start looking at in addition to it. At some point, I mean, I, there's very few and far between people that actually have like a completely separate, you know, resource of, of a team that does that. So it can just be something that's added on. Somebody had a really good thing that said, hey, we do our patches or cybersecurity when they do maintenance, right, downtime. So taking a look at your whole program and your, your con concepts of operations, whatever your, your normal day-to-day -day approach is, and seeing if you can add it into that. Again, also adding that into contractual language in the future. And then doing a comparative analysis on contract amendments to see if it would be worth the time and effort as you're adding other things too. So hey, we know we have to add this cyber language in the future, we're gonna add an additional paragraph for this, so now it's not even you, you're pushing it down. Right? So now they are responsible for ensuring that documentation comes to you and then you're tracking it as necessary, but you're not necessarily having to go back and look all the way down the chain. So traceability down, down the path of your subcontractors and so on, and then utilizing some current resources and then expanding the scope. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate it. We will now be taking a break. Please visit our sponsors in the exhibit hall.